Okay, welcome to Psych 101. This week we're talking about lifespan development. Okay, um, and here's our outline. Uh, for early development, uh, I'm just going to show you guys uh, some pictures and tell you guys some stuff really quick. Um, there's a lot of information when it comes to early development or prenatal development. Okay, way too much information for a Psych 101 class. So I'm going to show you guys some pictures and tell you guys some things and we'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, what I really want you guys to know about are going to be the theories that we're going to start, we're going to start talking about afterward. Okay. We're going to talk about intellectual development, Piaget stages, moral development, Kohlberg stages, and then on Wednesday we'll get to attachment, right? Um, we might get to some of that today, actually. We'll, let's see. We'll see. We'll talk about attachment and talk about two other theories of attachment. And then we'll talk about another theory, which is a lifespan theory. Okay. So we'll see how far we get, but mostly what I want you guys to know is about the different theories and what they say. That stuff about early development, prenatal development, I'm just going to tell you guys about it, but I'm not going to require all that information. It's just uh, too much detail, too much information, and I'm going to go through it um, kind of quickly. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about uh, prenatal development. And I'm not starting right at the beginning, okay? Um, so let me, uh, let me start at the beginning, just verbally, and, uh, and uh, tell you what these images have to do with. Okay, so you see when a man loves a woman, right? And they have sex, right? Unprotected sex. <clears throat> uh, what happens is that the sperm basically works its way up. And um, if the woman should be ovulating, the sperm will encounter uh, what's called an, um, an ovum, which is, you know, contains half of the genetic information for making a human. The sperm contains the other half. Those two come together and they form what we call a zygote. The zygote is the image that you see here on the upper left, okay? So the germinal period is the first 14 days. The first 14 days germinal because it's the period where this zygote, this fertilized egg, you could say, right, will begin to divide and will travel down the fallopian tube, okay? But you can see you have a zygote there, fertilized egg, and then about 30 hours later, you can see that it started to divide, okay? Uh, <clears throat> from one cell into two. Two days, more division, two and a half days, even more, three days, right? Uh, it begins to divide, okay, and divide rapidly. By four to five days, you see the image right there on the uh, uh, lower right. Um, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, developing mass of cells now looks like the planet Earth, which is interesting, right? <clears throat> so that's the first 14 days. Basically, the zygote is traveling down the fallopian tube and will eventually implant itself. And when it implants itself, um, you know, that'll be the end of the germinal period. Here's more information about the germinal period, first 14 days. Um, uh, during the, what's called the gastrula phase, uh, there will be three layers of tissue that will differentiate. So at some point in, in development, there'll be three layers of tissues. That, that's called the gastrula phase, okay? Three layers of fish, uh, tissue that develop the endoderm, mesoderm, and the ectoderm, okay? So the endoderm is the inner layer, the mesoderm is the middle layer, <clears throat> and the ectoderm is the outer layer, myself. Um, and then we, after, the, after the germinal period, we entered what's called the uh, embryonic period, okay? The embryonic period. Uh, three to eight weeks, right? Um, this is when, uh, after the germinal period, so the germinal period, the embryo travels down, implants itself, I mean, the cycle travels down, implants itself, and what implants itself, it develops further and becomes an embryo. Three to eight weeks is considered the embryonic period. You have this little embryo that is developing, okay? Uh, during this time, during the embryonic period, you'll see little arms, legs, the head, the chest, the abdomen all begin to develop, okay? You'll see little buds for the arms and legs, right? You see the head, although it looks too large. Um, <clears throat> interesting thing is uh, around this time, the heart will also begin to beat. Um, it's very interesting the way the, the heart uh, develops, but at just four weeks, there's a little tiny blood vessel that will begin to beat and that will become the heart later on. The internal organs will form and begin to function, okay? Uh, there's something called the neural tube that develops and that will become the brain and the spinal cord. That neural tube basically uh, is that thing that looks, it just looks like a worm, okay, at the beginning. And then it will develop into the, the one end of it will become the, basically uh, the brain and then the 
and then the other length of it, the length of it will become the spinal cord, okay? Uh, the placenta will connect the uh, embryo to the uterus and will nourish the embryo. That will also develop during the embryonic period. A lot of information here. <clears throat> like I said, you don't have to know all this stuff, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Um, the fetal, fetal period is nine to 40 weeks. During the fetal period, there's a lot of rapid growth and development, okay? Uh, what happens is that you have this fetus, uh, doesn't weigh very much at the beginning, and then by the time the fetus, you know, is ready for birth, um, you'll have, a, you, know, you might have a, a, a seven pound uh, fetus, something like that. Um, six and a half pounds, somewhere around there is close to the average, but some can be up to 10 pounds, even 13 pounds I've heard, right? Uh, that's unusual. But yeah, there's a lot of rapid growth and development. <clears throat> when you're pregnant during this time, uh, what will happen is basically uh, <clears throat> you'll go from just showing a little bit to showing a lot, to looking really big by right before birth, you know, during, uh, right at the end of the fetal period, uh, close to 40 weeks. If you make it to 38 weeks, that's still considered full term. Closer to 40 weeks is better, of course, if you make it to 40 weeks. Uh, something interesting happens uh, during the 12th week. During the 12th week, the genitals are fully formed. Okay, and then it's possible to do an ultrasound so you can see whether you have a boy or a girl. Okay, uh, during the fetal period, the heartbeat is strong, the digestive system is, and excretory systems uh, develop as well. The fingers, the toenails, the teeth, the hair will, uh, will develop, okay, during this time, during the fetal period. And there's an, a very important time called uh, uh, the age of viability, and that happens at 22 weeks. At uh, 22 weeks, <clears throat> Um, if the fetus should, uh, you know, be born around that time, if basically you have a newborn born at 22 weeks, um, what will happen is you'll have a 50% uh, a chance of, uh, not a actually not a 50% chance, less than that. Uh, you have a very slim chance that the, uh, that the newborn will actually survive at 22 weeks, right? But there is a chance, okay, uh, of, that's called viability. So at 22 weeks, um, should the child be born at 22 weeks, extremely premature, there's a chance the child could survive, but the chances aren't very good, okay? <clears throat> weeks later, uh, the chances will be much, much better. If I remember correctly, I think by about 28 weeks, the chances are like 50% that the, uh, basically the newborn will survive if, if they're born at like 26 weeks, or it might be 28 weeks, I don't remember exactly. Uh, <clears throat> but that's the fetal period. The child is born and then you have what is called a neonate, a newborn, okay? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and uh, they don't, just to give you guys some more information, they don't look this cute early on, okay? They don't really look like this. When they're born, okay, it's a very dramatic experience uh, usually, but they're born and they're all slimy and bloody, okay? They don't look very good, very slippery too, okay? But they'll clean them up, they'll clean up the child, you know, a little bit, and then they'll give them to you. But even when they clean them up, they don't look like this, okay? Uh, <clears throat> they may be kind of bluish at the beginning if, if it was a difficult birth and, you know, there was a little bit of a oxygen deprivation. Um, you want, of course, more of a pinkish color, and they're more likely to look this way as they get a little bit older, as the hours go by, you know, they look a little bit better. But at the beginning, depending on how it went, you know, uh, they may not look that good. They may uh, look a little bit pale or, uh, <clears throat> by the way, they look very pale, kind of grayish. That's not very good, okay? That might indicate that your child is lifeless, okay? But um, the point is they're born very bloody and slimy and they may not look this good at the beginning, but they look a little bit better as the hours progresses, progress, okay? So that's the newborn, that's the neonate, okay? That was all prenatal development. I went through it very quickly. Okay, that would be a whole chapter in a developmental psychology class, a whole entire chapter, but I just went over it with you guys in a few slides, told you guys some uh, uh, very brief things. <clears throat> um, I think I'm remembering now that uh, I still might have gotten the uh, layers of the gastrula wrong. I think what's, um, well, I still might have gotten that wrong. Okay, so I'm not gonna try to correct myself right now. I, I guess I have to review that information. I, I, I haven't talked about that in a while. Okay, um, now that we, we have the, the newborn, but remember, you don't need to know all that prenatal development stuff. I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit, and I'm not an expert on prenatal development, just so you're aware, I'm not that kind of doctor, okay? What I do want you guys to know about 
are the theories of intellectual development. That is the stuff that is more psychological. That is the stuff I really want you guys to know about that I'm gonna question you guys on, on your homework and on the exam. So the first theory uh, that I want you guys to know about is the theory, is the theory of intellectual development. And it's Jean, Jean Piaget's theory of intellectual development. Proposed way back in 1930. It's an old theory, but it's still the most influential theory of intellectual development we have, okay? And here's a quote from Piaget, Jean Piaget. Yes, he was French, okay? He said, if we examine the intellectual development of the individual, we shall find that the human spirit goes through a certain number of stages, each different from the other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Here's the thing. <clears throat> what this basically says is that uh, we go through certain stages. And at each stage, we understand the world differently. That's what he's saying. We're going to go through those stages now. So you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the first stage, uh, Piaget's theory of uh, development, is called the sensory motor stage or the sensory motor period. It's called sensory motor, okay? Birth to about two years of age. And I tried to simplify Piaget's theory for you guys. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but I, I break it up into strengths and weaknesses, okay? So strengths is what the child is capable of, okay? And then weaknesses is what they have trouble with, okay? So what the child is capable of during this time is mostly just reflexes. They're born, children are born with reflexes, okay? They can grasp, they can suck, right? Uh, they can swallow. They're born ready to breathe, to breathe basically, ready to survive, right? Uh, ready to feed. Okay, of course, they can also he see, they can hear, they can taste, they can touch, they can smell, right? Uh, reflexes, uh, <clears throat> they're capable of that. A lot of those have to do with the senses. That's why it's called the sensory motor period. Motor means that there's also movement. Yes, they are capable of some movement. Okay, at first, not much. They just kind of wiggle around. And then eventually, they will start crawling, okay? And then standing and walking and then running. By the time they're two years of age, you know, they should be walking and running, okay, by that time. Um, they'll start walking close to about a year of age, some a little bit sooner, some a little bit later, and then eventually the walking will turn to faster walking, and then eventually they'll be able to run, okay? That's why it's called the sensory motor period. What they're capable of mostly has to do with reflexes, their senses, right, and things that they can do physically. So it's called the sensory motor stage, sensory motor period. They have several notable weaknesses. And by the way, I'm more likely to ask you about the weaknesses, okay? <clears throat> Some important thing, the child doesn't really have a self-concept during most of the sensory motor period. And with the self-concept, we're talking about the fact that the child doesn't yet recognize him or herself, okay? So they fail something called the rouge test. They will ignore a red spot that is on their nose when they're placed in front of a mirror, okay? Um, <clears throat> the rouge test is simply where you put a red spot on the child's nose, sit the child in front of a mirror, and um, see what the child does. If the child touches his or her nose because there's a red spot on it, that means they recognize themselves. They have a self-concept. If the child ignores that red spot, the child doesn't recognize him or herself. They don't have a self-concept. And by the way, many animals don't have a self-concept. Your dog doesn't recognize himself or itself, right? Uh, I mean, doesn't recognize itself. I mean, does your cat or birds or things like that? Uh, most animals don't really have a self-concept, okay? Uh, now, chimpanzees do have a self-concept. They're a little bit more developed, okay? Their brain's a bit more developed, more advanced, okay? But that's the self-concept. It starts with just self-recognition. And then eventually that will turn into ideas about who, you know, we are, right? I'm a boy, I'm a girl, you know, I... I look this way, I like this, I like that, this is my family. The self-concept will continue to grow, but it starts just with recognizing oneself. Children also, that will develop basically toward the end of the stage, just so you know, the self-concept, okay? Object permanence is something also that's more of a weakness uh, during the sensory motor period that they will develop toward the end of the stage, but object permanence is the idea that objects is, exist when we don't see or hear them, okay? <clears throat> Um, so for a child, for instance, um, if they don't hear that squeaky toy, they won't have any interest in it, okay? So just to show you an example over here, let's go to the next slide. So you have a child over here, right? Um, we'll start with the image on the upper left, right? There is a toy in front of that child there. The child's wearing a red shirt, right? 
there's a toy or a onesie, whatever it is, right? There's a blue toy, blue stuffed animal in front of that child. And you can see when the, chi when the child sees the toy, right? The child focuses on the toy, is interested in that toy, and will probably start to play with it. We don't see the child playing with it, but the child becomes interested in the toy, and the child will reach for it and probably play with it. However, look at the image on the uh, upper right. If you take a screen, it could be a, you know, a piece of paper or cardboard, or it could just be a rag or a tissue or blanket or something, cover up that toy, and then the child will immediately lose interest in that toy. It doesn't see the toy, it doesn't hear the toy, so the toy might as well not exist, okay? Out of sight, out of mind. The child doesn't yet understand that the toy still exists when it's not seen or heard. The child won't try to reach around that piece of paper or piece of cardboard and try to grab the toy. It just doesn't exist. The child immediately forgets about that toy, okay? That's object permanence, okay? That's the lack of object permanence. If the child had object permanence, the child will, would reach around that piece of paper, that piece of cardboard, and would still grab the toy. Will reach under that blanket and still grab the toy, okay? If a little ball rolls away from a child, if the child does not have object permanence, the child will not go after that ball. If the ball rolls away and out of sight, they don't see it anymore, they will forget about it, okay? But if the child has object permanence, the child will see that the ball rolls away into another room, they can't, the child doesn't see the ball, the child will crawl after that ball, knows that the ball still exists even though the child doesn't see it or hear it. Um, and then the person on the bottom right there, that mother is playing peekaboo with her child. Children love to play peekaboo dur during this time. Why? Because it has to do with object permanence. See, mommy puts her hands in front of her face, covers herself up, and then she opens her hands and she says peekaboo, right? And the child giggles and laughs. Why is this so interesting to a child? because it's as if you're disappearing and reappearing, right? Disappear and you reappear. You can do it with a blanket as well, or a shirt or whatever it is, whatever you have. Uh, children find it very amusing. One time they see you and then they don't see you, okay? They do not object, have object permanence. Things that they don't see, it's as if they don't exist. So to them, it's like magical. Here I am and now I'm not here, right? Um, as they get older, they will no longer find uh, Peekaboo interesting. They will understand you're still there behind those hands, behind that blanket. It won't be interesting anymore. But that's what object permanence has to do with. The idea that something still exists when we don't see or hear it. Children lack this during the sensory motor period. And then uh, as we enter into the later stage, into a later stage, we enter the pre-operational period, which spans ages two to seven years of age. Okay, two to seven years of age. Um, the strengths now, um, Self-concept, object permanence. You see the things that the child couldn't do early on at the previous stage, now they can do. So they still have the previous strength, right? The, the senses still work, reflexes still work, they can still move around, right? But now the things they couldn't do, now they can do those things. Now the child has a self-concept, will recognize him or herself in the mirror. Now the child has object permanence. The child will, you know, reach for that toy if you, you know, if you cover it up, right? Peekaboo won't be interested any, uh, interesting anymore. Now they understand that just because they don't see something, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, okay? They understand that something still exists even if they don't see it or if they don't hear it, okay? So now these are strengths. Now, what is the problem? What are some weaknesses? Children still have some problems during this stage. The weaknesses, they are very egocentric. They can't consider somebody else's perspective, somebody else's point of view. Children are very egocentric, okay? Um, so for instance, if uh, you ask a child, you know, mommy's birthday is coming up, what should we get mommy? The child might say something like, let's get mommy a toy, a toy truck, right? Mommy would probably like a real truck, but the child says, let's get mommy a toy, right? Let's get mommy a toy truck or a stuffed animal, right? They can only think from their own point of view, okay? They are very egocentric. If there's a toy, it is their toy. Even if that is somebody else's toy, or if it's a toy at the store, they are very egocentric. They do not yet have the brain capacity to think from somebody else's point of view. There's also no reversibility during this time. They can't reverse concepts. This also has to do with being egocentric, right? They can't think from somebody else's point of view. So a boy will say that his brother has no brother. So a boy has a brother, okay? 
the boy understands that that's his brother. But if you ask him, what about him? Does he have a brother? The boy will say, no, he doesn't have a brother. Yes, he does. If you're brothers, you, you are both each other's brother. Okay, but they can't reverse the concept. They can't reverse that idea. There's also a problem with conservation. No conservation, okay? They can't conserve number, length, volume, area, mass, etc. Let's look at the next slide so you understand what we mean by this. But they don't, they're not capable of conservation. No conservation. They don't understand, what this means is they don't understand something can look different, but it's still the same. Still the same number, length, volume, etc. Let's look at this next slide to demonstrate. So you can see there, um, there's some rows of pennies at the top, right? So the top images there have to do with conservation of number. It says that children acquire this at about six, seven years of age. So toward the end of the stage, okay? So if you show a child two rows of pennies, okay, like the images that you see in the middle, two rows of pennies, right? Each row has the same number of pennies and they are spaced equally, okay? You, you ask the child, um, does each, uh, are, are these, uh, are these, are there the same number of pennies in each row? And the child will look at the, at the rows of pennies, okay? And the child might even count, if the child knows how to count, one, two, three, four, five, six for the first row. One, two, three, four, five, six. The child will look at them again and say, they're the same. That's what the child will say. They understand that's the same number, right? Now, if you take the bottom row and you squeeze it a little bit, and you do this right in front of the child. You ask the child, now are there the same number of pennies in each row or does one have more? The child will look at the rows of pennies again. We'll look at them closely and we'll even, might even count if the child knows how to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, the top row. One, two, three, four, five, six for the bottom row. The child will look at them again and will say, this one has more, the top row has more because it appears to take up more space, therefore it must have more pennies. You see, that's lack of conservation. They don't understand that something can look different and still be the same, still have the same number. Conservation of liquid, also called conservation of volume. Two glasses there of juice, fill them up to the same height, and you ask them, is there the same amount of juice in each glass? Child will look at them carefully and will say, they're the same, they have the same amount. Now you take, the, uh, you take one of the glasses, right? And you pour it into a taller, thinner glass. And you do this right in front of the child. <coughs> the child sees the same amount of juice go from one glass to the other. And you ask the child, now is there the same amount of juice in each glass or does one have more? So the child will look at it and say, this one has more. The taller glass now has more. Obviously that's wrong, but the child doesn't understand that something can look different and still be the same. Conservation of mass, two balls of clay. They understand those two balls of clays have the same amount of clay. Okay, take one and smash it, make it a little bit longer, and the child will now think that the longer one has more clay, which is wrong. Conservation of area, does each cow have the same amount of grass to eat? Yes, for the first set of pictures there, right? But if you take the little squares for one of the cows and spread them out, the child will now think that that cow now has more grass to eat. See, that's lack of conservation. The child doesn't understand that something can look different and still be the same number the same volume, the same mass, the same area. The child has a problem with conservation. The child doesn't even understand physical objects very well yet. Let's keep going. And then we enter stage three. Stage three is seven to 11 years of age. What are the strengths now? Now the child understands concrete logical thinking. Now the child can think orderly about things, logically about things that have to do with blocks, coins, about physical things. That's, called, that's why it's called the concrete operational stage. Now the ch child understands reversibility, conservation, right? The child is not so egocentric anymore. So now the child can reverse concepts, right? If he has a brother, that means his brother has a brother. Child understands conservation now. You won't be able to uh, fool them so easily now with those coins or those glasses of juice. The child now understands. Yeah, same juice going from one glass to another, right? Same amount, right? They're still the same. Notice how that was so hard for them at the previous stage, and now it's easy for them. Now they understand. Because now they're at, a, at the next stage. Now they understand things concretely. Concrete operational stage. So now they understand things that are physical pretty well. 
And it's a good time, you know, you know, to teach them things, you know, with physical objects. You can help them understand math with blocks, with coins, with things like that. Uh, they understand physical things very well. They have weaknesses. They have problems. What they lack is, is abstract logical thinking. They lack orderly logical thinking about things that are mental, things that are abstract, things that they can't necessarily see or hear or touch. Okay? So things have to do with hypothetical reasoning, if-then kind of statements, right? If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, that means that what? That confuses them, right? It's hypothetical. Or morality. The fact that something could be wrong in one situation, wrong in another, that confuses them. Or what the heck is morality? It's not a physical thing, right? They have trouble with that. Philosophy, what the heck is that? Government, democracy, what is that? Right? It's hard to explain this stuff to them because this has to do with things that are abstract, things that are mental, mental concepts. They understand physical things really well. Those are their strengths, right? They can, now they understand conservation. They can reverse things, but they don't understand things that are abstract, things that are uh, basically that do more with mental things, things they have to imagine. Okay. We enter the last stage, and that's called the formal operation period, 11 years and onward. If you get there, according to Piaget, not all children get there. The strengths now, right? There's no weaknesses now. It's the last stage. Now children understand abstract logical thinking. Now they can understand the mental stuff really well. Now they can think more like scientists, right? They understand hypothetical reasoning. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, that means that what? A is also greater than C. Right now, you can they they're more capable to understand things with no physical basis, things that are more mental, like hypothetical reasoning, which we just talked about. Right, think more like scientists. Morality, right? What is morality? What is philosophy? What's government? What's democracy? Right now, it's easier for them to understand those ideas. Okay, that's the formal operational stage, when they finally start to under, understand the things that are more abstract. Okay. And that, that, is P, that is Piaget's theory of intellectual development, okay? And remember, it is the uh, actual uh, theories that I want you to know about for your homework, uh, for your exam, when we get to the next exam. I know I stumbled a little bit talking about prenatal development. I didn't review the information, and I'm not an expert on that stuff. I'm not that kind of doctor, okay? I am a, I am a doctor, but am I, uh, I have a... I have a doctorate in experimental social psychology. Okay, I understand psychology and how to do research, right? Not really, uh, you know, a that kind of doctor, a medical doctor. But anyway, I stumbled a little bit about on that. But you don't really have to understand all that stuff. It's just more for some information, okay? And um, what you really have to know is this stuff: understand Piaget's theory, do the homework for practice. We're moving on to the next theory, okay? Another theory you have to know about is the theory of moral development, okay? Moral development. Moral development has, has to do with thinking about right and wrong. Lawrence Kohlberg proposed this theory of moral development in 1981. It's the most influential theory of moral development. Well, that's why we're going to talk about this one and not the others. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all the theories, but Lawrence Kohlberg, yes. And according to Kohlberg, moral reasoning, moral development, understanding right and wrong, also progresses through what he called levels. He didn't call them stages, he called them levels. There's level one, two, and three. There's three levels. And the levels are similar to Piaget's stages of development. In other words, children who are young understand things in one way, children who are older understand things differently, and children who are even older understand things differently as well. When children are very young, they understand right and wrong in concrete terms, physical consequences. When they get older, they're capable of understanding right and wrong in more abstract terms, in more mental ways, okay? So it's similar to Piaget's theories of intellectual development in that way. And that's what Thor uh, Lawrence Kohlberg's theory is about, okay? It's a theory of more reasoning, theory of right and wrong, which we're gonna describe in a moment. Um, as far as his methods, Kohlberg, uh, like to use uh, dilemmas, what, what is called a, uh, a moral dilemma for understanding right and wrong. See, he wanted to understand uh, how people understood right and wrong at different age 
Okay, so he presented dilemmas to children who were, you know, young, you know, not too old. He presented dilemmas to teenagers and even to older people, okay, uh, to try to understand right and wrong. He presented a moral dilemma. A moral dilemma is a special kind of problem in which there is no good solution, that either way there are pros and cons. And here's a moral dilemma, okay, and here, a very shortened version of it, just so you understand the, just the gist of it, because it's actually uh, a little bit long to describe this, and I didn't want to write a whole page on this PowerPoint. But um, this one is called the Heinz Dilemma. So Heinz, you know, just like the ketchup bottle, right? That's his last name. Heinz had a wife and she was near death. She was dying, okay? There was a drug that might save her, but Heinz could not afford it. He didn't have any health care, okay? No Obamacare, all right? No health care. He was poor, he didn't have a good job, I guess, and he didn't have uh, good benefits. He had no health care. He couldn't afford the drug. He couldn't afford the treatment. What is Heinz to do, right? Should Heinz steal the drug to save his wife, right? Try to break into the pharmacy or the lab or whatever to try to save his, uh, his, his wife and potentially be arrested and get thrown in jail or maybe even killed and shot up by the police, right? Or should Heinz not steal the drug and just obey the law and let his wife die? You can see that this is a special kind of problem. No matter what you do, there's going to be problems, okay? If you choose one thing, there are some good things, there's some bad things. If you choose something else, there's some good things about that and also some bad things. There is no perfect solution. That is what you call a dilemma. And uh, Kohlberg would ask questions like these to people of different age, to children that were young, to children that were, uh, you know, you know, right before puberty, to those that were already teenagers, to, and to people who are already adults. And he found that people think differently about right and wrong at different ages. So he came up with levels of moral development. And the first level is called level one. Level one is called the pre-conventional level of moral development. Notice how it sounds similar to Piaget's theory, okay? Similar names here, do not get them confused, okay? That will be a difficulty on the exam where you'll get the names of the stages confused. These with Piaget's, you have to know which is which, okay? They're not the same names, but they sound similar. So the first level of moral development starts at age four, goes to about age 10, is called the pre-conventional level. Level one moral of development, okay? By the way, before four years of age, there is no morality. Children do not understand right and wrong. But about age four is when they start to realize, yeah, you know, some of these things are right, some of these things are wrong. They start getting into trouble and you correct them and that's how they start understanding right and wrong, okay? At level one, morality is based on rewards and punishment. That's why I have a trophy there. It's like, hey, you got this reward, you did something right, or you get punished, right? They send you to the back of the room, they make you wear that, you know, that pointy hat that used to, they don't do that anymore. Now they just send you to the back of the room, but that pointy hat used to say dunce, which really means you're dumb, okay? That's what that means. They don't do that anymore. That's considered, uh, you know, bad, okay, to call children that. But uh, that's level one. Level one uh, is basically called the pre-conventional level of morality. And during this stage, you understand right and wrong based on physical things to clear it up for you. Physical things, concrete things, okay? Things that you can see and touch and feel. Rewards and punishment. Okay, that's what children understand. So should Heinz steal the drug? A child might say, no, Heinz should not steal the drug because if he steals the drug, he'll go to jail. That's a physical consequence. That's what children understand. Or a child might say, yes, Heinz should steal the drug because if he steals the drug, he will have a wife. That's the physical consequence. It's a good physical consequence. Notice right and wrong is based on things that are concrete, things that are physical. That's what children understand. Heinz was not really interested in whether you said yes or no to the question. He was, in, not Heinz, uh, Kohlberg, the, the, the author of the theory, was not interested in whether you said yes or no to the question. What he wanted to know was your reasoning. Why yes, why no? Your reasoning determines what level of morality you're at. Level one is basically when it's just based on rewards and punishment, okay? When it's based on physical consequences. So let's, let me give you another example so you understand more, an example that you guys can relate to a little bit more to. Uh, should they legalize marijuana? 
okay? I know a lot of states legalized it already. Okay, maybe not a lot, but some states have. But should they legalize marijuana? If your answer is yes, they should legalize marijuana because I like weed, I like smoking weed and should be legal, right? That is level one more, uh, level of uh, morality, right? You, are, you believe something because of the consequence, because of the reward. Or if you say, no, they should not legalize marijuana uh, because it's bad and uh, they should throw you in jail and stuff uh, for doing that bad thing, right? Uh, actually, that's all, yeah, that's also level one. In other words, um, not, not bad, bad is not the right way to say it, but uh, let's say that the marijuana is just, uh, no, you should not legalize it, okay? You believe that uh, and it's because you don't like marijuana. Let's put it that way, right? Say, no, I don't like marijuana. They shouldn't legalize it. That is level one, okay? It's physical consequences. It's kind of selfish, right? Uh, it's, it's just concrete things. That's level one. Or if we ask, well, never mind. I'll save this example for later. I want to confuse you guys. I'll save these, another example for later. Let's, let, let's go look at level two, uh, level of morality. Level two is 10 to 13 years of age. So these are children a little bit older now. They entered level two. That's called the conventional level of morality. Now morality is based on the approval of others. So what is right and what is wrong has to do with what other people say is right, what other people say is wrong. Which is why when I said that they should legalize marijuana, when I said, oh, it's bad, so therefore they shouldn't, uh, that is not level one, that's level two. When you say something is bad, that usually means that other people think it's bad, so you think it's bad, okay? It's what other people think. The things we think, usually a lot of things that we think are good um, or bad usually has to do with what other people have told us. Not always, but I'll save that for later, okay? But level two basically means that right and wrong are based on what other people think, the approval of others. Should they, so should they legalize marijuana, right? If your answer is, uh, well, uh, most people smoke it, so yes, they should legalize it. Not true that most people smoke it, by the way. But if that's your answer, yes, then you, and you say they should legalize it because uh, most people agree that they should legalize it. Most people agree it's okay. That's level two. You're just going with popular opinion. Or if you say, no, they should not legalize marijuana because, uh, you know, my parents taught me that, uh, you know, that it's a drug and drugs are bad for you. My teachers told me it's bad, you know, so therefore, no, I don't believe they should legalize it. That's also level two. You're just going along with the opinions of other people. You're just going along with the approval of others, okay? Um, getting back to the example of Heinz, so should Heinz steal the drug? The child might say yes, right? Because people will think you're a bad person if you don't save your wife. You're a bad person, right? What other people think is important here, okay? So a child at this level will say yes, people will think you're a bad person if you don't save your wife. Or a child might say no, Heinz should not steal the drug. One should be a good citizen and obey the law, right? A good boy, like that picture right there, right? You need to be a good boy, a good citizen. In other words, do what you're told, okay? Level two level of morality is based on the approval of other people. You are basically going along with what other people say is right. What other people say is right may be a majority of people, or it may not be a majority of people, okay? It doesn't matter whether it's a majority or not. You're just going along with what other people think. Right? I mean, you might be in the majority when you say that, yes, marijuana should be legalized, okay? But if you say that it should be legalized because most people agree with that, that's level two, okay? Or maybe you, you, you know, you're in the minority you know, and you believe that it should not be legalized because your parents are conservative and they told you, no, you shouldn't smoke weed, that's bad. And you agree with your parents, that's level two, okay? Level two is just basically what other people say. Okay, uh, other examples, you know, should you, uh, should you, uh, you know, uh, uh, drink alcohol at a party, even though you're underage, right? You can't legally drink yet. If you say, well, everybody else is drinking, so I'm going to drink, that's level two. All right, level two is when you do something or you believe in something because other people believe in it. There is a higher level of moral development, and that's called level three, what is called the post-conventional level of morality. Here, morality is, is basically what we call true morality. It's based on internal standards. It's based on your own beliefs and abstract reasoning, your own beliefs and your understanding of the concept, the mental concept, okay? 
What does it mean for something to be right, wrong? What do we mean by having uh, freedom or for, for there to be justice or whatever it is, right? Um, what does that really mean? You have to think about what it really means and make up your own mind, not just go along with the crowd, not just do something or believe in something because it benefits you. 13 years and onward, if you even get there, according to Colbert, a lot of people don't even get there. They're not capable of thinking in this way. And if you think about it, yes, uh, most of our society is at this level over here, level two. Most of what we do and what we think and we believe is based on popular opinion. And some people are just incapable of thinking any better than that, any higher than that. But there is a higher level, which a lot of us are capable of. Not everybody is, a lot of us are capable of, but we often don't think at this level because we don't want to, because it's easy to just go with the crowd, okay? So level three is what we call true morality when you do your own thinking based on your understanding of the concept, okay? So should Heinz steal the drug? A person might say, no, Heinz should not steal the drug because you know laws are made to benefit society. Heinz should obey the law because uh, we need laws because without laws, we would have chaos. We would have anarchy, right? It's a philosophical argument. Notice, it is level three. It's a philosophical argument. You can argue for the law at a philosophical level, at level three. But you can also argue for the law at level two and then say, well, it's what people think it's right. So therefore, that's what's right. That's level two. Should Heinz steal the drug? A person could also say yes, because life is more precious than laws. When there's a conflict between life and law, life should always win out. It's a physical, it's a, it's a physical, it's a philosophical argument. To help you understand this a little bit more, let me give you an example, okay? Should they legalize marijuana? If you say, yes, they should legalize marijuana because I smoke weed and I like it, right? That's level one. You're just being selfish. You basically are just going with the physical consequences. Um, or, uh, you know, or if you say, uh, uh, no, they shouldn't legalize marijuana because, uh, you know, uh, well, because, uh, you know, if I smoke it, I'm going to get in trouble. My dad's going to beat me. That's also level one, physical consequences, okay? Um, if you say they should legalize marijuana because most people agree that marijuana is not bad for you and that uh, most people think it's okay, that's level two, okay? Um, but if you say they should legalize marijuana, because in this country, we have something called freedom of speech, which also means freedom of expression, which means that I should be allowed to use this drug if I choose to. That is level three, okay? You are arguing for marijuana, but at level three, you're making a philosophical argument. Let me give you another example so you understand a little bit more, okay? Uh, because popular opinion isn't always right. So, so you understand, okay? Um, let's talk about slavery. In the past, slavery was legal. It was the law, okay? Some people, were, you know, when asked, you know, should slavery be legal? Uh, of course, and people say, yeah, slavery should be legal. And they said, and they say, well, I have slaves. I need these slaves, right? These slaves make me money, right? That's level one. Say that's physical consequences. Most people said that slavery should be legal uh, because they went along with what they were told by others, you know, uh, about that slaves aren't really full human beings, that they don't have rights, that they're property. That's what, the, that's what a lot of people believed hundreds of years ago. Actually, not even that long ago, but hundreds of years ago. And even the churches did not speak out against it. They said, look, slavery is in the Bible. It's okay with God. It's okay with us, right? That's where most people were at with, sla with slavery. But there's other people, even during that time, that said, no, it doesn't matter that most people agree that slavery is right and that it says that it's in the Bible. It is still wrong. These people are human beings. They have every right to be free. And slavery is just wrong. It's morally unjust. Those people were thinking at a higher level. But those, by the way, those people were the ones who were really you know, at the forefront of that progressive movement. It was considered progressive back then. Back now, of course, if, if everyone believes that slavery is wrong, but not back then, okay? And there's people who thought for themselves, who went against the majority and changed things, okay? 
what, it, what the majority of people believe isn't always right. It isn't always necessarily wrong either, but it isn't always right. It's possible that the majority could be wrong. You have to think for yourself on a higher level. When it comes to who you're going to vote for for president, whether you should vote yes or no on this proposition or that proposition, think for yourself. Read and understand what you're really being asked. Don't just go along with some TV commercial. That's level two, right? You're not thinking for yourself. Just go in with whatever they tell you or with what your political party says, right? Oh, no, no, we are against this. So you should vote no for that. Do your own thinking. Parties are evil, okay? Groups telling you what to think, not to think for yourself, telling you what to believe. It's a very bad thing. Think for yourself, please, okay? When you make decisions, especially important ones about who to vote for, okay? Don't go with popular opinion always. Make up your own mind. But then, of course, you guys are going to have your own reasons for voting however you vote. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean you're going to vote the same way, you know, but as long as you think for yourself, that's what I ask. That would be level three. And some people are incapable, by the way, of thinking for themselves. They're just going to go along with whatever the party says. They're going to go along with whatever their family, the church, or whatever it is says, right? A lot of people are incapable of thinking on, uh, for their own. But that would be level three. When you think for yourself, it's the highest level of morality based on your own standards, your own beliefs, your own understanding of the concepts. And if you thought about those things, hopefully you come to a just conclusion. All right, um, that's Kohlberg's theory of moral development. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on and talk about uh, another theory. And this is a theory of attachment. More interesting, this chapter goes, uh, this lecture gets more interesting as we move along. It'll be more interesting on Wednesday, um, the second half. Um, let's talk about attachment, a theory of attachment. Okay, so we talked about how the uh, individual goes through uh, stages of intellectual development, stages of moral development. And now let's talk about how the individual or the infant develops an attachment. Okay, um, attachment is basically a bond between people, between mother and, uh, and, and child basically. Uh, that's the strongest bond, okay? There's also a bond between the father, of course, and, and the child. It's not as strong as the one with the mother, usually. If the mother's around and, and the mother is usually the one that is the most involved and the child forms a stronger bond. But let me t tell you about Mary Ainsworth, uh, basically uh, about how she studied attachment. Mary Ainsworth and the strange situation. Mary Ainsworth uh, developed in... Uh, a, and it's really an observation, she developed a situation where she can observe mothers and, and their infants to determine uh, infant attachment styles. By doing these observations, Mary Ainsworth determined that, uh, that there's different attachment styles. Here's the situation, okay? I'm gonna tell you a little bit more than what's on this flow chart over here. But basically, Mary Ainsworth recruited mothers and their infants to come to the laboratory and she had set up a little area, a little play area with a rug and some toys where the mother and child could interact. At first, number one, the parent and the child are alone in that room. How does the child behave? Does the child uh, play with the toys? Does, does the child feel safe? Does the child interact with mommy, right? What's going on? Okay, hopefully the child explores the room with parental supervision. Hopefully the child feels safe and explores the room, okay? And then after a while, number three, a stranger enters and starts talking with the parent and approaches the child as well. How does the child behave then? Eventually, the parent leaves the room as well. I mean, the, eventually, the parent leaves the room. How does the child behave? And at some point, the parent returns and tries to comfort the child. How does the child behave then? So it's a series of observations and to try to determine what kind of attachment the child has uh, to the mother. So there's a point in which the parent and child are there alone together, right? How's the child behave? What happens when a stranger enters the room? How does the child behave now? What happens when basically mommy leaves the room and leaves the child by him or herself? How does the child behave then? What happens when the parent comes back and reunites with the child? All these things help Mary Ainsworth and her colleagues determine what she called the infant attachment styles. And here they are, we're gonna talk about them. You have to know this. What you want with your infant, when you're a mother, you also with a father, you also have a type of attachment, but 
what's considered the best attachment style is called the secure attachment. And I'm gonna tell you a lot more than what's here, by the way, but with a secure attachment, uh, the child prefers the parent over a stranger, okay? Um, when the parent and the child are there together in the room, the child feels safe and secure, okay? The parent is used as a secure base for the child to explore. So the child will check back with the parent and ask mommy if it's okay, right? Give mommy a kiss, check back with mommy, and the child will play with the toys and every now and then come back to mommy. The child feels safe and secure and the child will explore the room, will play, and uh, basically it means that the child trusts the parent. It's a secure relationship that has trust, right? The parent is used a secure base and is sought in times of stress. When a stranger enters the room, the child will run to mommy and wants to know if it's okay. If mommy acts like everything's okay, then the child will no longer be afraid and will continue playing, okay? The, child do show, the children do show distress when caregivers leave, right? You know, parent leaves, leaves the child alone, children don't like that, right? Uh, but they are happy when the caregivers returns. When the, when the parent does come back, the child is happy to see mommy and they run to mommy and they hug mommy and they're easily comforted. These kind of care caregivers are sensitive and responsive to their infants. If you're a good mother, good father, but usually it's the mother bond relationship we're talking, mother child relationship we're talking about. But if you're a good mother <clears throat> and you're sensitive to your child's needs, right? You feed the child when the child needs to be fed, you comfort your child, right? Clothe the child, right? Keep the child safe, all that stuff. And you are responsive You play with your children, right? Give them a lot of attention, right? Then you'll probably develop what's called a secure attachment with your child. That means your child will trust you and feel safe around you. When you're around, they feel, uh, they have confidence, they feel safe, they'll explore, they'll play, they'll, you know, they'll even be friendly with strangers if you basically show the child that there's nothing to fear here. And then when you come back, they don't, when you leave, they don't like it, but when you come back, uh, they're happy to see you again. That's a secure attachment. It's basically a relationship filled with trust, okay? Hopefully you had that kind of relationship uh, as an infant with your own mother. I'll tell you that I did not, okay? I had a more of a, what we call an insecure attachment style. Um, there's two kinds of insecure attachment styles. Actually, there, well, there's, um, yeah, there's at least two types, okay? But uh, here's another type of attachment style. I don't mean to confuse you guys with other terminology, but there's also what we call an avoidant attachment style. An avoidant attachment. It's a type of insecure attachment. Insecure meaning that it's not really that trusting, okay? The avoidant attachment style is where the child is basically unresponsive to the parent. The child kind of ignores the parent, does not really use the parent as a secure base, doesn't check back with mommy to make sure things are okay, does not care if the parent leaves. So in the observation room, the child basically will play with the toys, won't talk to mommy, won't play with mommy, stranger walks in, the child will not check back with mommy. If mommy leaves, the child may not even notice. The child has learned to ignore mommy, probably because mommy hasn't given this child a lot of attention and has kind of avoided and maybe neglected the child, okay? When the parent does return, the parent leaves, when the parent returns, the child is slow to show a positive reaction. May not even notice the parent was even gone, okay? Um, if you have this kind of attachment with your infant, uh, well, you're more likely to have this kind of attachment with your infant if, if the caregiver, if you're uh, an insensitive caregiver and inattentive, basically mean, it means you let your child fend for him or herself. You don't play with them. You don't really interact with them too much. Uh, you may ignore their cries, don't even feed them when they want to be fed. And just when you want to feed them, let's say, or when you're available, maybe you're not always available. What's happened is basically you've ignored your child a lot. You've ignored your child a lot and they have learned to ignore you. They have become avoidant. Not a good relationship to have with your child. And it has consequences down the road, by the way. They're more likely to be avoidant with others as well. So that's the avoidant attachment style. It's also an insecure attachment style because they don't really trust you. That's what that means, okay? And then there's another type of attachment style called the uh, resistant attachment. It's also an insecure attachment where the child doesn't really trust the mother. Resistant attachment is where the child shows clingy behavior. The child doesn't wanna let go of mommy. 
but the child will also reject the caregiver's attempt to interact with them. So in the, alone, when the, the parent and child are alone in the room, the child won't play with the toys. Instead, the child wants to hang on, with mom, hang on to mommy and wants mommy to hold the child and comfort the child, but at the same time isn't happy with mommy and will reject mommy. It's like child is mad, basically, and crying and scared, and they're not easy to comfort, and the child won't play. Child doesn't really trust mommy. The child will not explore. They're too fearful. They want to be hanging on to mommy all the time. They're very disturbed and angry during separation. The child will, be, when mommy leaves, the child will cry and scream and be very angry, very disturbed, okay? They are very difficult to comfort. Uh, when the parent does return, it's very difficult for the parent to comfort the child. You'll try to comfort the child, pick up the child, and they'll be mad at you and crying and yelling, maybe even hit you, and they're very mad. They're very upset. They're very difficult to comfort. Um, parents who have this kind of attachment to their children have been kind of inconsistent with their children, inconsistent in their responsiveness. In other words, sometimes they're there for their children, sometimes they're not. So the child has kind of become clingy, doesn't know what to think. The child is fearful of, of basically being left alone. Sometimes mommy's good, sometimes mommy's not so good. Sometimes mommy's there and sometimes she's not. Okay, and the child doesn't know what to think. The child is scared and fearful. The child is clingy. Okay, that's the resistant attachment. Okay, it's also not good. The child doesn't really trust you. Okay, that's the resistance. Attachment. That's kind of attachment I had with my mom because she was kind of in and out of my life. That's, you know, that's kind of how it was. So I wasn't really have the secure infant. And I kind of was like that growing up as well, too, in my other relationships. If you are the kind that in relationships, you are clingy and you need a lot of attention and you need basically, you need to call all the time and they need to basically, um, how should I say, uh, put you at ease a lot reassure you, you are clingy, right? You are resistant. You probably had that kind of attachment with your own mother early on. If you're the type that's avoidant, you don't really talk too much to people, you kind of ignore the person you're with, you don't really show your feelings too much, right? Then you're the avoidant type, right? You probably had that kind of relationship with your own uh, mother early on. Um, if you're secure, that means you have a good relationship and you trust people and they trust you and you are more likely to have a healthy relationship as an adult with others. Uh, there's also the disorganized attachment where the child kind of behaves oddly in this strange situation. Child may freeze, run around, you know, when the caregiver returns, when they're around, uh, they behave oddly. The child, they behave kind of like as if they're mentally disturbed already. It's a, it's a very common thing in kids, for instance, that have um, special needs, you know, like um, children who have, are on the autism scale autism spectrum will also behave, will behave this way, but also children who have been abused because they will also have issues. Either way, these children are acting as if they have some kind of mental disturbance already, some kind of psychological disorder. They behave oddly. Um, and just so you know, it says their abuse disrupts the child's ability to regulate their emotions. These children are not very good at regulating their emotions, at controlling their behavior. The child might have ADHD or autism. Maybe it's not your fault, right? But maybe it is. If you've been beating, abusing the child, you could also make your child like this, basically disorganized. You know, you make them, it's like, a, it's like they're mentally ill to some extent, right? They have some psychological disturbance. That's the disorganized attachment, okay? Um, those are the um, infant attachment styles, okay? Disorganized, the resistant, avoidant, and then secure. Secure is what you want. And this is what Mary Ainsworth discovered when she observed these infants and their caregivers. And usually that means the infant and the mother. Fathers also have attachment to their infants. Um, and it could be very different than the one the mother has. It just depends on how they interact with their children as well. Okay, that is where we will stop. Okay, so I'm gonna stop recording.